All right, let's go ahead and open up to, I was going to say Matthew 26, but we're actually finishing up Psalm 118. So why don't you go ahead and open up to Psalm 118, uh, and we're going to finish that up this week uh, and then move on in our Matthew 26. We've kind of gone to Matthew, or to Psalm 118, because remember, in Matthew 26, 30, he's talking about they've had the Passover meal, they've had the Last Supper, and now they're singing that final song, that final psalm, the Hallel, Hallel Psalms, uh, Psalm 113 to 118, are sung throughout that whole Passover event that they experience. Uh, they've already so sung Psalm 113 and 114, 115, 116, 117. They're at the end of the night, and they're singing as they leave Psalm 118. These are really the last words Jesus has together with his disciples. These are the final things. They're looking at each other. They're singing this to each other. Uh, they're thinking about this is his, these are what make up his final thoughts and the final thoughts of the 11. Remember, Judas has left already, but the 11 and Jesus, as he goes now in the final hours uh, to his death, he's going to go next to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to go then. He's going to be betrayed, taken, uh, by his enemies uh, and those illegal, illicit trials. Uh, and within just a matter of maybe 10, 12 hours, he's going to be on that cross. And these are the final words they're saying together. So I thought that's why it would be important to look at this psalm. Last week we looked at this psalm, and remember psalms, I'm not going to go through everything we did last week, uh, but we, it is important to realize that these psalms need to be read consistently with the tool of right division. Uh, and when we come to these psalms, we have to realize they're not written to and about us. You can't go in there and name it and claim it. Uh, it's a different program. Uh, he's, God has a different purpose for the nation of Israel than he has for the body of Christ. Uh, it's a different situation. And so we have to keep that in mind. And when we come to the psalms, uh, we need to realize that there's really three different ways of looking at the psalms. Last week we looked at the primary way, or the, the, what I actually call the minor application way, and it takes something in David's history, something that actually happened to David. Usually it's something that happened to him in distress. Sometimes it's happened something that happened in, in, in a happy time, but usually it's under distress. He writes a psalm, and uh, get, the Holy Spirit records it in the scriptures. That's one. That's the minor application. But there's major applications. The Holy Spirit then takes that minor situation that applied to David from his history, or the, one of the other psalmists from their history, usually it's David, and he takes that and he blows it up. He magnifies it, he expands it, and it will apply to something about the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, uh, the classic example of that is Psalm 22. In Psalm 22, you see there the, the, the Christ on the cross, actually going through his thoughts and what he's doing, I'm thinking about on that cross and what God's accomplishing on that cross for him. Something far beyond anything David actually went through in his history, uh, and he, the Holy Spirit takes it and blows it up and applies it to the ultimate son of David, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the ultimate son of David because he's also the son of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, God himself, enfleshed in the human line of David so that he could do what no other son of David could do. You take all the other sons of David, you put them all together, individually or collectively, they couldn't do it. They couldn't save Israel. So God himself and fleshed, entered into the human line of David, became a son of David, and he's going to do what no other son of David could do. He's going to save the nation of Israel, implement that Davidic covenant. So that's a, a major application. It blows out. In our Psalm 118, we're going to have a blowout by the Holy Spirit, and he's going to apply this to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is actually going to take this. This is what we're going to emphasize today. He takes this psalm. This psalm was really a life psalm of David. Jesus is going to take that life psalm and claim it for himself in Matthew, especially, and especially apply it 
to that final week uh, as he goes to the cross or just before the final week and the final week. The other application, which we're not going to spend much time on, it's really the more general application. Uh, the Holy Spirit will take this historical event, this difficulty, uh, this time of trial or tribulation in David's actual history, and he'll blow it up and apply it uh, to that believing remnant of Israel. David as kind of the representative, the, the head of that believing remnant, and he, they're gonna, he's going to apply it to them. And, of course, that's going to have its uh, biggest application in the trials and tribulations of that believing remnant as they go through that time of trouble, that tribulation period, that seven-year tribulation period. That was a, that's what this... These psalms apply to uh, specifically. That's what these psalms are written to and about. And we uh, come now and we understand them in that text. We can't take these things out and apply them to us today directly uh, because uh, God's not doing the same thing today that he was doing in David's time. And we'll see a couple examples as we go through here. So let's just kind of refresh our memory. This psalm, Psalm 118, we've been through most of it already uh, from the standpoint of, Hugh, of David's history. Remember this psalm, he wrote this psalm at the high point of his history. Remember how low David was? He was just a shepherd in the sheep coat. He's in a field with the sheep. He's the youngest son. Nobody expected him to turn into anything. God picked him, and he's been going up and up and up and up, and then he becomes the king of Israel. And there he reaches that high point, and as king of Israel, he brings the ark, uh, the ark of the covenant, that, uh, in, that into the tabernacle. He brings it to Jerusalem and into the tabernacle. It's at the high point of his career, and he writes this psalm when he brings that ark into the temple. In, well, it wasn't a temple at that time. It would have been the tabernacle. Uh, into Jerusalem and the tabernacle, he writes Psalm 118 the high point of his career, at the high point of where he's at. He takes everything that he learned from the time he was a shepherd, uh, taking care of sheep, cleaning up after sheep, all the way to the Lord making him king of Israel. Takes all those things he's learned, and he put it in a psalm. Psalm 118. And we saw that as last week, and I'm just going to list them out here. We're not even going to read through this. But as you go through the psalm, the first four, four verses, he talks about he's learned in that upward trend as God took him from the sheep coat to the, to the king of Israel uh, that God's mercy endures forever. That's one thing he's learned. And since his mercy endures, endures forever, he knows the Lord is on his side. And as the Lord is on his side, the Lord is with him. He, gonna, he does the obvious and logical thing. He's going to trust in the Lord. He's not going to trust in himself. He's gonna, not going to trust in men. He's not going to trust in princes. He's going to trust in the Lord. The Lord will take it. Uh, he's going to then rely on the grace resident and his Jehovah name, the all cap Lord there. Uh, and the Lord's going to cut off his enemies. And it's going to result in, by the time you get down there to verses uh, 17, 16, 15, 16, 17, uh, he re it becomes his salvation. And you have this whole flow that goes through here. This is what David learned. This is what he learned on the way up to the high point of his life. God's mercy endures forever. The Lord is always with him. Uh, he needs to trust in the Lord and rely on the grace resident in his Jehovah nation, uh, in his Jehovah name, and that will result in his salvation. So you get this whole general trust of now he's way up here. He's the king of Israel. He brings back the ark. They, they were with the Philistines, and then it was outside Jerusalem. He captures Jerusalem. He's king of Jerusalem. He builds the he puts the tabernacle there, brings in the ark of the covenant. He's at the high point, and he writes this psalm. And now, what God's going to do for the rest of this psalm, as we pick it up at the last half of the psalm here, he's going to use this psalm as we watch David go downhill. David's going to go down. He's everything he learned on the way up. 
now as he goes down, as he makes all these mistakes and all these things come about that lead to his downfall, he's going to, God's going to keep reminding him of verses in this psalm. This psalm becomes the basis for the Davidic covenant. God's going to take, notice in each of these ones, we're not going to go back to 2 Samuel 7, each one of these uh, things brought out in the, in, the, uh, in the psalm, God takes each one of those. Mercy is going to be the basis of the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. Uh, the Lord is on my side. God says in that Davidic covenant, I was with you wheresoever you went. The Lord, I will trust in the Lord. That's what he says in that uh, Davidic covenant. Every single thing, God bases that Davidic covenant on a psalm David wrote several years before. He's answering David's psalm, and he makes him these promises on David's heartfelt desires. And he promises to David, he himself will enter into the line of David and do everything for him. Just rely on the Lord, trust in the Lord, rely on the grace resident in his Jehovah name, uh, and it'll result in salvation. That's what he's found up to this point. All right, so now let's pick it up from there, and let's just look at these last couple things that we left off with. We're going to watch now. He's going to make use of Psalm 118 as David falls. So far, the first half of the psalm, we watch David go up, everything he's learned on the way up. Now we're going to watch what happens to David on the way down. And let's pick it up there. We will begin reading here at verse 17. Uh, and we looked at this last week, so we're not going to do the, uh, the cross-reference verses, but they are here if you weren't here last week or want to follow up on your own. But verse 17, he says, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. That is a, that the Lord took that verse uh, and made Nathan tell that verse to David at the, when he confronted him about his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. Remember, the, that, was the, that was the turning point. David's at the high point, and then you get this sin with Bathsheba, coveted Bathsheba. Uh, he committed adultery, then arranged the murder of her husband, bore false witness. The coveting, Paul says, is just another word for idolatry. He's broke his relationship with God. He's broke his relationship with his fellow humans. He's no better off than those children of Israel at the golden calf incident. All God could do was put him to death. David even says, all you can do with me is put me to death. Nathan gives him that parable, and he says, that man should die. And God says, remind David about a verse he put in Psalm 118. Thou shalt not die, I will live. And he brings up, he takes something out of that psalm, and he applies it to David as he goes downhill here. And he didn't die, remember. But what did happen instead, he didn't die, verse 17. Verse 18, but the Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over to death. But he did chasten him. And when was David chastened? When is the one time David says he's being chaste, ch chastened? Uh, if we looked over at 2 Samuel 15, 25 and 26, it's when David, uh, that whole Absalom uh, rebellion, where the nation of Israel rejected David as king. Remember, David gets uh, removed as king. And he goes into exile. He leaves Jerusalem on a donkey. And on his way across the Jordan, he leaves, he's exiting, and he tells the priest, take the ark back to Jerusalem because the Lord's chastening me. I don't know if I'm going to be back or not. If it's the good pleasure of the Lord, I'll be back. If it's not the good pleasure of the Lord, I won't be back. This is the Lord's doing. And he goes into exile. Absalom becomes king. It's only for a couple days, but he becomes king. He wins the heart of the people, and the nation of Israel rejects David and sends him away, and he goes into exile. So now you have the rejected king. So he's being chastened, and he's going to be chastened severely. And Paul, or excuse me, uh, God reminds him of a verse from Psalm 118. He was chastened. That's what he's doing here. He's leaving. He's the rejected king. 
All right, then we have David's triumphal entry, though. David's going to come back. Absalom's only, remember what happened to Absalom? He gets, his hair gets caught in the, uh, in the tree, and, and Joab, uh, David's man, comes and puts him to death. And then David comes back. The rejected king comes back. He's going to return. And the route he takes, we saw last time, again, we're not going to go look at all these verses, but the route he takes this time, and I actually have a map here. It's not a great map for doing this on, but uh, if we want to kind of think of this, because this is important, because really what we want to get to today is how this applies to the Lord Jesus Christ. So now you have the rejected king, and he's going to return to Jerusalem, and he's going to see if the people receive him now. At this time, is he still rejected, or are they going to receive him? So if we go through the account, and all the verses are in the previous slide, but he's on the other side of Jordan. He's, going to, uh, he's on the other side of Jordan here. He's going to uh, cross Jordan, and he's going to go to Gilgal. Remember what Gilgal? It's the eastern border of Jericho. He goes to Jericho. And hopefully this sounds familiar uh, to a route we, heard, we just read about in Matthew. Uh, Jesus also goes uh, the other side of Jordan, goes to Jericho, goes to Mount of Olives, goes to Jerusalem, goes to the temple. Well, guess what path he's taking? He's taking David's path because David starts his path on the other side of the Jordan. He's greeted there by the people of Israel and the political leaders. They ask him to return as king. They go with him over Jordan, through Jericho, up the Mount of Olives, down the Mount of Olives, and what do they see? Verse 18, verse 19. We have the return of the king. Verse 19, open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord. Now they're coming to Jerusalem, and they're entering. Here's Jerusalem. Of course, this is the Jerusalem uh, in Jesus' day. Uh, but there would have been, in, that, in uh, David's day, it would have just been, <clears throat> been, of course, a tabernacle. But there's these gates they're going to go in that surround the city. And he's coming down out of the Mount of Olives, and he's looking down. He's got the political leaders with him. He's got the people with him, the multitudes. Maybe we could refer to them like they're referred to in the gospel accounts. And they come through, they go through Jericho, up Mount, halfway down the Mount, they see Jerusalem and its gates ahead of them, and they sing this psalm. Open the gates of righteousness, I will go into them, I will praise the Lord. Then they go down here and they go to one of these gates. And this is what it says, verse 20, the gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. Now we get, they come, David and his, he has the political leaders, the people of Israel, they enter into Jerusalem, they go uh, into the gate, and they go into, he calls it here, the gate of the Lord. And what happens in the gate of the Lord? Verse 22, the stone which the builders refused, that's David, he was the rejected king. He went into exile, now he's coming back. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone uh, the headstone of the corner. The people of Jerusalem now receive him. The, ki people, the king they rejected, they now receive. David has been received by the people of Israel. He's been received by the political leaders. He's been walked into the Jerusalem, went into the gates of Jerusalem. He was received by the people of Israel, the one they rejected, excuse me, the people of Jerusalem, the one they rejected, they're now receiving now let's keep walking. He doesn't end here. He's going to go in. He, let's say he goes in this gate here. He's walking through Jerusalem, heading to what would have been at that time the tabernacle, not the temple. But look what the next verse says. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Uh, and notice now the pronouns change. It was a singular I. Everything was I singular. Now it's plural. This, verse 23, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So now you have the multitudes. You have the, the uh, people of Israel that followed him in, the political leaders. You have the people of Jerusalem, and they're all singing this. This is marvelous in our eyes. This is the work of the Lord. K David's returned. We accept the king. We receive the king. 
24, this is the day which the Lord hath made. They're singing this. We will rejoice and be glad. They're rejoicing. They're glad the king has returned. The one they rejected has now come back and will be their king. And they receive him. And here they sing, save now I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. And they appeal to the Lord. Of course, this is the Lord in heaven uh, to now provide, save them and provide prosperity. That's established the kingdom. That's when prosperity is brought in for Israel. It's in that kingdom. And he's going to... They call on the Lord. They address the Lord. Save us. Establish the kingdom. We receive the king. Establish his kingdom. Then they go further. So now we come. We've been over the Jordan. We've gone through Jericho. We've gone up the mount, down the mount, saw the gates of Jerusalem, entered the gate of Jerusalem, heading to the temple. The whole time now, the multitudes, the people, even the people of Jerusalem are uh, rejoicing and glad. Now there's one more stop we have to make. He's going to keep walking. He walks through Jerusalem, and he's going to enter the tabernacle. And this is what we read in verse 26. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of where? Out of the house of the Lord. So now they've made all this way. They're entering into the house of the Lord. Uh, to be the tabernacle, of course, as I've said earlier in David's day. They go into that, and now not only have the people of Israel received him, not only have the political leaders received him, not only have the people of Jerusalem received him, but now they, he goes to the tabernacle, and the religious leaders receive him. Blessed are thou, we bless you out of the house of the Lord. And the religious leaders call out to the people and they're telling them, receive the king, receive the king. This is the king. Blessed he is out of the house of the Lord. David's entrance as the rejected king was truly a triumphal entry. And that's the route now that we're going to see the Lord Jesus take. Uh, but... Uh, unfortunately, Jesus is saying going to take that same route, uh, but the conclusion isn't going to be the same. So as we go through in verses, uh, oops, in 23 to 27, we saw blessed and received. David is received as Israel's, and I really put the word in here, rejected king. Uh, the one who was rejected is now received, blessed and received. All Israel, political leaders, they're all marveling, rejoicing, full of gladness. They sing the song, save now, Hosanna. Uh, o oh Lord, O oh Lord, establish the kingdom. Uh, establish prosperity uh, in that kingdom. The king is here, uh, and even the religious leaders receive David. Blessed and received by the religious leaders of Israel in the house of the Lord. Uh, blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord ushering the people in a festal profession, a procession. Uh, and then where are they going to go? We've been over the Jordan, through Jericho, up the mount, down the mount, see the gates of Jerusalem, enter a gate, go through Jerusalem, singing and praising and worshiping and rejoicing, enter the tabernacle for here, but this is the temple in Jesus' day. They're going to go to the altar. And what do they do at the altar? Verse 27, God is the Lord which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even under the horns of the altar. Now they're going to go and they're going to offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. They're going to go to the altar. That's the whole route he's taken. Now, the important thing to realize, the Lord Jesus Christ in our accountant Matthew is going to take that same route. He's going to go that same route. Uh, but unfortunately, the ending is very different. Uh, verse 28, uh, thou art my God. God himself does this. Thou art my God. God the Father will do this through the Lord, God the Son, who comes in the name of the Lord, God the Father, bringing salvation to Israel, ensuring that his mercy endureth forever. 
and that's what takes us to the end of the psalm. Uh, remember that idea, the Jehovah name, capital in our English, it's ca all caps, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's that God's Jehovah name. Uh, and it primarily in the Old Testament refers to God the Son, Jehovah, God the Son. But it can also be applied to Jehovah, God the Spirit, and Jehovah, God the Father. Just the way in our New Testaments, when you read the word God, what is it usually, who does it, who is it usually referring to? It's usually referring to God the Father without other qualifications. That's usually what it's referring to. Uh, but it can also refer to God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. So that Jehovah name kind of works in that same way. All right, so now let's look at the major application. That was what I call the minor application. I'm sure it wasn't minor to David in his life. Uh, but minor, that sets the groundwork, that gives us the structure of what's going on here. And now we're going to look at the Holy Spirit blowing that up, and he's going to apply it to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The son of David, not a son of David, not even a son of David or the son of David who comes in the name of the Lord, but it's the son of David who also is the son of God, the Lord himself entered into the line of David so that he could do what no other son of David could do, provide salvation for the nation of Israel. So we're, now we're going to look at this from the standpoint of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hopefully, we're not going to go back uh, beginning in Matthew 20 uh, and go through Jesus' whole route. We've done that already. We're in Matthew 26. Uh, but hopefully you'll have already put together that the route we looked at for David is the same route the Lord Jesus Christ took in Matthew 20 and 21 as he's going down, going down into that area. Uh, and so now we're going to look at how this expands into the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're just going to look at it very generally. Uh, in those first four verses, uh, the Lord Jesus came to fulfill the Davidic covenant, God himself and fleshed into the line of David, ensuring it will be fulfilled and endure forever. He is the source of the merciful good, kindness God extends to Israel. That's that first four verses where he keeps saying his mercy endureth forever. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ is the author. It's a, so he's the producer of that mercy. That's the only way it could endure forevermore. He's the one that's going to do it, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we go on to... Uh, verses 5 and 9, remember the key thought there was uh, God is with us, the Lord is with me, uh, the Lord is for me. And there we have Jesus, the son of David, who is also the Lord, the son of God, who always relied on the Father. Remember in those verses? I'll look at verse uh, 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. Better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. And if we were to go, let's go just flip over to John and uh, remember that in Christ's earthly ministry, uh, everything he did was in reliance on the Father. Every single thing he did was in reliance on the Father. He was uh, a, a perfect man who lived out his life in reliance on the Father. And we'll just look at one example of this. Look at uh, John 5.19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son. Likewise, uh, the Son is in complete reliance on the Father. We've seen that in all throughout the Gospel accounts. Uh, that's just one example. Uh, and the Father was with him. The Father was continually with him. He's the, he's the epitome of this psalm. Uh, and he's the, where David could, did everything imperfectly, the Lord Jesus does everything perfectly, in perfect reliance on the Father. And the Father was with the Son. And we're going to see that as we go through uh, some more things here. So that takes it, uh, that's his application to other parts of the psalm. In verses 10 to 16, we had the destruction of his enemies. Uh, and remember, Jesus had his enemies. That's who ended up putting him on the cross. The Gentiles and Israel joined hands together uh, to attack and destroy him. Uh, and, of course, he's, we're going to see that most clearly now as we go through these trials 
uh, in tribulations and he's going to have these illicit trials uh, that are going to lead to his, their putting him on that cross. Uh, but he's going to destroy his enemies as well. Uh, that's going to happen out at that second coming. He's going to destroy his enemies. Now he's providing redemption for Israel, but in that future, he's going to return as Israel's deliverer and avenger. He's going to save his friends, destroy his enemies. Verse 17, verse 17, Jesus repeatedly said he would die, but raised again on the third day without seeing corruption. David says here, I'm not going to die. And you understand when David says he's not going to die, he means his idea of death is he's going to stay dead, right? I mean, he's going to keep on being dead. Uh, and Jesus said he's going to die, but he's going to be raised again on the third day. So it's not the same type of death David was talking about. He's going to die, really die on that cross, uh, but he's going to be raised again after three days. And so you see a little bit how he magnifies that out, the Holy Spirit, and takes that and applies that to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, and this will take us up to the point where the rejected king returns, uh, in verse 18, where we have, The Lord hath chastened me. Uh, while Jesus had no sins of his own to be chastened for, he did take the chastening of Israel's sins onto himself at the cross. All those curses of the law and the courses of punishment, or maybe a better word, I think my uh, reference Bible, when I call them the courses of punishment, uh, it might be even better to call them the courses of chastisement. Of course, we don't use the word chastise too much anymore. Maybe the best of all words would be discipline. Uh, because that gets a point the cross. There, it's not just a punishment to, for punishment's sake. It's discipline to turn someone around so they start doing the right thing. And that's what these courses of punishment. And they had all, he gets, they just entered these and their rebelliousness and their sinfulness and the curses of the law came upon them. And they entered those courses of punishment. They got that 10,000 talents of debt, national debt. And no one could pay, no nation could pay, no empire could pay. God's going to take all that and put it on the Lord Jesus Christ on that cross. Jesus is going to, while he had nothing to be chastened for himself, he's going to take onto himself the chastening of the nation. And we will look up that. Let's look at the cross reference with that. Flip over to Isaiah. Flip over to Isaiah 53, a very famous passage. Isaiah 53, and you'll see this. Isaiah 53 uh, we're heading to verse 5, but let's begin at verse 4. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We already had uh, that referred to earlier in Matthew. Yet we did esteem him stricken. Uh, important to, there, the stricken and the smitten of God and afflicted. You know, the very next verse we come to in Matthew, right now we're in Matthew 26, 30, and that's about this hymn, the Psalm 118 we're looking at now. The very next verse, verse 31, it says, the Lord Jesus is going to be smitten by the Father. I, the uh, Jehovah God, will smite the shepherd. Smitten of God. Verse 5, this is what we really need for our passage here. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So the one who had nothing to be chastened for on his own identified himself uh, as a member, a citizen of the nation of Israel, and he then automatically became under their national debt. He had no debt of his own, no sin of his own, came under the national sin, and he's going to carry that sin to the cross. And he's going to be chastised. He's going to take their chastisement onto himself. And he's going to completely pay the debt. He's going to completely deal with it in a perfect and permanent manner. Take their chastisement. All right, now we're back to uh, David and his path here. Jesus follows David's path. Uh, and uh, I guess maybe it'd be better, since 
in case you, we don't have this right in our mind, let's go back to our map here, if I can find it. Uh, and Jesus is going to take the same thing. If we were to go back, time won't allow us here now, but hopefully if you've been in the study of Matthew for a while, you remember that Jesus came down from Galilee, went to the other side of the Jordan, uh, just like David did. He crosses the Jordan and goes to Jericho, just like David did. He goes, as, as, and remember, he's the rejected king. When in Matthew uh, did the nation reject Jesus? Remember back in Matthew 12? At that point, there was a turning point, right? Uh, Jesus went from a public ministry to the nation as a whole, and he's, he uh, told them he wasn't going to talk to them anymore, and he sent them back to Matthew 1 and said, go through it again. And if you respond in faith, then you'll recognize uh, the sign of, jo Jude, uh, sign of Jonah I'm going to give you when I'm raised from the dead. And if you recognize the sign of Jonah, then you'll participate uh, in the city of refuge I set up in Jerusalem through the ministry of Peter and the Twelve and the Holy Spirit. And if you participate in that ministry, uh, you'll receive me. He turns away in Matthew 12, away from the, the rest of the nation, and he now turns to his own people that believing remnant, Peter and the 12 and, their, and the disciples. And remember, he starts talking to them in parables. So the rest of the nation can't understand. And he tells them, these, he goes and gives them a further truth into what's going to happen. He was the rejected king back in Matthew 12. He, he had a, a large Judean ministry, Jerusalem ministry. That's in the book of John. He goes up to Galilee. He comes back in Galilee crosses the Jordan like David, goes to Jericho like David, goes into the Mount of Olives like David, goes to, looks down at the city of Jerusalem like David, enters the gates of Jerusalem like David, enters into Jerusalem and the temple. But the response, remember, was very different. And that's what we're going to take a look at now. So David is going to, or uh, the Lord Jesus is going to pick up with David's route here, and uh, he's going to go and he's going to follow that same route in. And unlike David, though, he's going to uh, the stone that the builders rejected. That was back in Matthew 12. He's returning now as the rejected king. This was a this this psalm provides a valid option for the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel could have responded the way the nation of Israel did with David back a thousand years before, when they received the rejected king. Jesus comes now a second time to Jerusalem and offers himself again as the rejected king. He even takes the same route as David. He comes on a donkey like David. He, and he comes singing the same psalm like David. He's singing this psalm here. The stone, verse 22, which the builders rejected, that was in Matthew 12 for the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, is become the headstone of the corner, but it didn't. The, he comes in, he returns to Jerusalem, and the head, uh, the stone that the builders rejected, the leaders of Israel rejected, what they kept on rejecting. They rejected his ministry. And now is going to have to wait till the after the resurrection, God himself would make Jesus the chief cornerstone. And at his second coming, he'll establish that kingdom. He comes in, and the nation could have received him the way it received the rejected King David. And instead, they persisted in rejecting him. You have the same psalm. This is an option that Israel could have taken advantage of. This is something, the way, this is a way this could have turned out for Israel in their day. And they reject, continued to reject them. And now let's go step by step through this and uh, we'll see this. Verse 22, let's pick it up now uh, where D uh, David left off, uh, where David's route turned into reception and uh, receiving of the king. The Lord Jesus, every step of the way, is going to continue in rejection. Uh, and a refusal to accept the king. 
So the stone which the builders refused has become the head of the stone of the corner. It's not going to when Jesus, the rejected king, comes. They're going to continue to reject uh, the, chief, the, key, the, the stone that would be the chief cornerstone. They're going to refuse. Uh, unlike David, they're going to continue to reject by the people and Israel's leader. Uh, but after God raises him from the dead, uh, God will make him the cornerstone of that kingdom at his second coming. Verse 23, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the, the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Here we have, uh, remember that in Matthew. Uh, we read there in Matthew 23, the multitudes come with him in and they're singing this song. But it just turns out to be a superficial praise, right? There is no rejoicing. There is no uh, re, uh, rejoicing at this at all. He's going to continue to be rejected. And what's he going to do over Jerusalem? What was all Jerusalem doing uh, in when David returned? They were rejoicing and glad. What is going to happen with, when Jesus returns to Jerusalem? He's going to be weeping over Jerusalem. He's going to weep. The rejoicing and the gladness of Zechariah 9.9 isn't going to be fulfilled in, in uh, our Matthew account. It's going to be fulfilled out in that future when he returns again. And now we get to the critical verse, and hopefully this is nothing new uh, in what I've been saying because we've been talking about this going all the way back to when it was quoted in Matthew 21. Uh, but there is only superficial uh, rejoicing. It's going to have to wait till his second coming. Uh, and now we have the rejection of the people. Your rejection by the multitudes and the leaders. Remember when David uh, went to the other side of the Jordan? Who was with him? The political leaders, they, all the nation, all the uh, tribes of Israel came and their, their leaders, their, the political leaders came down and pleaded with David to return, be our king. And the multitudes came from Israel and followed him and he went across. Well, Jesus had multitudes, but he didn't have the political leaders. And he goes to Jericho. And Jericho, what happened in Jericho? In Jericho, you have the high point of Christ's return. What do you have in Jericho? You have two blind men, right? And what do they sing? They sing this psalm correctly to Jesus. They say, uh, let's look at the verse first here in our Psalm 118, verse 25. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. The two blind men in Jericho are the only ones that responded correctly. They said, well, let's go there. Let's go to Matthew 20, and you can see it for yourselves. Matthew 20, just before he enters Jerusalem, Matthew 20. Look what these two blind men, he's gone across the Jordan, he's gone into Jericho, verse 30. Matthew 20, verse 30, and behold, Two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, have mercy on us. Where have we read that in this poem? In this poem, in the psalm. Uh, what's the first? His mercy shall endure forever. He's appealing. He's, this, these two blind men have Psalm 118 in their head. They're in Jericho, and they know he's coming across Jericho. They know his route, and they're going to appeal to his mercy that endureth forever. He's got this mercy in them. And uh, what do they cry out? They cry out saying, have mercy on us. O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more saying, have mercy on us. O, o Lord, thou son of David. Those double O Lord there comes right from uh, Psalm 118, 25. O Lord, O Lord. That is the key phrase. That's the difference between receiving the king and rejecting the king. And what do the multitudes that follow them, him across, what do the multitudes do uh, when these two blind men cry out, O Lord, O Lord, thou son of David? Look what the multitude does, verse 31. And the multitude rebuke them 
because they should hold their peace. Now, they weren't rebuking them and telling them, to, you know, hold their peace is just a nice way of saying shut up, right? Uh, they're not just saying that because, you know, Jesus is preoccupied in a meditative state and he, he should, they shouldn't be intruding in his thoughts and let him, don't slow him down. Or, they, that's not why they're, in, they're rebuking him. They're rebuking the two blind men because the blind men address Jesus as, O Lord, O Lord. The multitudes were willing to address him as thou son of David, thou son of David who comes in the name of the Lord. They were even willing to say that. But they rebuke, they refuse to address him as O oh Lord, O oh Lord. And we're going to see that as we go through here. And the multitudes refuse to sing. Uh, verse 25 of Psalm 118, they refused to sing Jesus this song unedited as the two blind men in Jericho did. Instead, they rebuked the two blind men for addressing Jesus in this way. Uh, and now when we get to uh, flip over a page, I guess as long as we're in Matthew, I really wasn't going to go back and doing this thinking we'd have all these in our thoughts from having done it before, but I guess as long as we're here, now they go, that was Jericho, they go up the mount, down the mount, in the gate, and the multitudes are singing now. They're supposed to be singing Psalm 118, and they chose verse 25. But look what they actually sing. Uh, verse 8, Matthew 21, verse 8. And a very great multitude spread their garments of the way. Others cut down branches uh, from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes, multitudes that went before them and followed cried out, Hosanna. Now, hopefully, if you got your finger in Psalm 118, flip back. Don't lose this spot. Flip back to 118, verse 25. You see where the beginning words are saved now? That's the word Hosanna. So they start out verse 25 with the word that's in verse 25. Hosanna, or which means save now, is the way at least the King James here has it translated. Save now, Hosanna. They begin the verse right. Hosanna, but now look what happens. To the son of David, blessed is he that come in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They start the verse right, but what do they take out? Go back, flip back, keep your thumb or some uh, finger or something in Matthew, but go back to verse 25. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord. That's what the psalm says. They're supposed to be singing the psalm. And they start out with the first word, Hosanna, or save now, but then they kick out, O Lord, O Lord, and they put in, Thou Son of David. That's not the same. There were a lot of sons of David. There were a lot of sons of David who came in the name of the Lord. As a matter of fact, David, uh, who was obviously not a son of David, but David himself, look up a little bit further how he did everything. Verse 12, we'll pick it up at verse 12 in Psalm 118. They compassed me about like bees and are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord... David came in the name of the Lord. There were many sons of David who came in the name of the Lord. Uh, to say that Jesus is thou son of David, who, one who comes in the name of the Lord, isn't enough. They kick out, they take a pair of scissors, and they refuse to sing the psalm the way it's written. They remove, O Lord, O Lord, and put in thou son of David, who uh, comes in the name of the Lord. Now that's... Uh, mild praise, but it's not the praise. What happens in this journey from across the Jordan into Jerusalem is you're going to have his uh, reception knocked down, knocked down, knocked down till he's totally rejected. It's going to be not a triumphal entry like David's. It's going to be an untriumphal entry. It starts out good. If they had sung what the two blind men sang, they'd have the psalm right, uh, and they would be singing it right. They kick out, O Lord, O Lord, replace it with, O thou son of David, who comes in the name of the Lord, which is praise, but not saving praise. They're still rejecting that Jesus is the Lord. And that's what separates him from all the other sons of David. He's not a son of David. He's not the son of David. Uh, and now where da David goes in, 
Uh, and he goes into the city, and they recognize who he is, glad, rejoice, receive him. What If we were to look back at the historical accounts, what do the people of Jerusalem say? David's the one that saved us. We know he's the one that saved us. And they receive him. You get into Jesus going into Jerusalem, and what do the, what do the Jerusalemites say? Who is this? It's not because he didn't make himself known. It's because he made themselves known, and they rejected him. The multitudes, the two blind men had it right. Uh, the multitudes reject, throw out the, O oh Lord, O oh Lord. Now look what the next stage is. Uh, n- next stage, as we go through here, go down, flip back to Matthew 21, and you'll see uh, he's now there in the house, in the temple, uh, and look what it says in verse 15, Matthew 21, 15. So let's just keep the flow here. Uh, Psalm 118, 25 says, Hosanna, O Lord, O Lord. And then the next verse talks about uh, the one coming in the name of the Lord. And look what uh, they're even going to rule. And the multitudes throw out, O Lord, O Lord, put in thou son of David who comes in the name of the Lord. Now they go to the temple and look what the religious leaders do. Verse 15, and when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased and said unto unto him, Hearest thou uh, what they saith? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have you not heard? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. So here, if we go back quickly to our map, probably should have put another one in here so I didn't have to go so far. Come to this other side of the, of the Jordan. They enter, go to Jericho, and two blind men get it right. O Lord, O Lord, thou son of David. The multitudes rebuke them and say, don't address him as O Lord, O Lord. Son of David's okay, but not O Lord, O Lord. They go now into Jerusalem, and they're singing uh, a a. a, a edited, I guess you could say, to put it nicely, version of Psalm 118, 25. They say the Hosanna, and they replace, O Lord, O Lord, with thou son of David, one who comes in the name of the Lord. Then they go into the temple, and the religious leaders won't even address him as thou son of David, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It's a total rejection, an untriumphal entry. And he's going to have to come back again for that triumphal entry. That's going to be at that second coming. So let's go down here now uh, and look. Remember uh, in verse, uh, let's pick it up here at verse 25 and 6. We have this whole situation here. Catch up in my, catch up in my slides here. Uh, there we go. Uh, and he's, we've shown that the multitudes now have rejected him as, O oh Lord, O oh Lord. They rejected the person in the psalm, the rejected king coming back. And now verse 26, here we go. David goes into the temple, or of course at that time it was the tabernacle. Verse 26, uh, he goes in the people. They receive him. They sing it. They appeal to the Lord. He goes in the temple and they flow, throw open the tabernacle. They throw open the curtains of the tabernacle. The religious leaders come out and they say, verse 26, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Throw open the curtains of the tabernacle. And the priests, the religious leaders say, Come in, we bless you out of the house of the Lord. The religious leaders received David a thousand years before. The real, what do the religious leaders do when Jesus goes to the temple? They say, don't you hear the children? They're, they're describing you as the, the son of David who comes in the name of the Lord. We don't want you even addressed as that. They reject him. They reject, O oh Lord, O oh Lord. They reject even that he's the son of David who comes in the name of the Lord. It's a total rejection. And now, when we get to the end here, I did put this in chart form. If anyone wants to go step by step through this, we won't do it now. But it shows you all the substitutions that were made. 
the end uh, thing in David's experience, his return, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, was that they were shouting, David is our, is, has come to save us. Salvation is in David. And they were rejoicing. Uh, and what happens to, in Jesus' return to Jerusalem? What's the best, what does the Jerusalemites say? They say, who is this? And what's the best response as multitudes from Galilee can say? A, a prophet from Nazareth, maybe even the prophet, the prophet of Moses from Nazareth. But, and those aren't wrong. The point is, they're not right. Because you throw out the old Lord, old Lord, the son of David doesn't really matter, and the prophet of, of Nazareth doesn't really matter, even if it's the prophet of Moses. doesn't matter. Without the, the only thing that separates him from everybody else to be able to accomplish Israel's national salvation is that he has to be the Lord. And to throw that away, it all just, once you throw that away, it just crumbles. An untriumphal entry, and we end with Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. Zechariah 9.9 will have to wait and go from there. So Jesus is the only one qualified. Uh, brings that out now as we close out the psalm. He is the only one. Uh, verse 27, God is the Lord. So this is what this whole thing is all about. It's the Lord. He's God. This isn't just another son of David. It's not just another son of David who comes in the name of the Lord. Even David came in the name of the Lord. And many of his sons, some of those better kings uh, that, were, that went, walked according to their father David, uh, they came in the name of the Lord. This wasn't just another David who came in the name of the Lord. This isn't just another prophet from somewhere. Uh, this is, O oh Lord, O oh Lord. And then add on all those other titles. God is the Lord, who, which hath showed us light. And of course, what, how does John open up? He's the light of the world. Not because he's just a son of David or one who comes in. It's because he's the Lord. He's God. And then he ends, uh, David, they went into the tabernacle. They were received by the priests and the, the religious system, and they go to the altar to offer the sacrifice. And here we have God is the Lord, which hath showed us light, bind the sacrifice with cords even to the horns of the altar. This is a valid option. It's, a, it's a, a, something that Israel could have responded. They, instead of putting their um, uh, king on the cross as enemies and in rejection and in rebellious unbelief, they could have taken Jesus to the altar in faith, singing this psalm. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to die at that exact time the next morning. How he gets there doesn't matter. He's going to be on that cross. And you know why? Because it's not really Judas that put him on that cross. It's not the vain religious system or the vain political system that put him on that cross. We like to have boogeymen and everything, but you got to remember we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, God. Remember in Gethsemane, he says one word and all the Roman guards were thrown back. And I think he did it twice. He goes, he, Peter cuts the guy's ear off and he said, what are you doing, Peter? Don't you know? I could call down uh, 12 legions of angels. I could call down the whole angelic army. That wasn't any of those people putting him on that cross. Our very next verse, and we'll end with this, our very next verse in uh, Matthew 26, verse 31, is that I will smite the shepherd. The I there is God, the Father, the Lord God the Father. That's a quote from Zechariah. It's God that puts his son on that cross. The son is going to that cross of his own free will. He's going to that cross. But he's going to be rise again on the third day. So it's not a death like we think of death. It's not a death like uh, David thought of death. This is a death that in three days he's going to be raised from the dead. He has to go to the cross, though. He has to go deal with the nation's sins. 
He has to go there. Otherwise, this nation won't be saved. And they could have taken the Lord Jesus Christ singing Psalm 118 to uh, that altar like Abraham did with Isaac. They refused to do it that way. So God now has to do it. He has to be taken there on his own and through the hands of the enemies. And that's going to be very important as we finish out Matthew 26. This is the, uh, he uses the terminology together with more than any other part of the book. He wants to be with the 11. He wants to do everything with them. He wants them to go with him and be with him and sing with him and eat with him. They want, he wants them to watch with him in the garden and pray with him. And, they, and instead, what do they do? They flee, they scatter, they desert him. And that's where we'll begin next time. Let's close with a word of prayer.